Um, uh, I too have been uh, struggling with the news, as um, Amy phrased it, and today in particular, uh, I don't normally have uh, trouble choosing what to read uh, at an event. There always seems to be something that feels right, um, and that feels like something I connect with that day, but I was really uh, struggling today. It felt like just flipping through stories I had written, um, I was coming across all sorts of unsavory uh, behavior from male characters, um, <laughs> saying, saying something you know, inappropriate or doing some kind of small or large violation, and I just, um, there was a lot that didn't feel um, right to read today. So um, I decided to just go with the, the one story that had kind of extended scenes where there are no men at all. Um, and, uh, you know, there's still um, kind of little violence is being done. Um, it's still fiction, but um, this, this little part is from the beginning of a story called The Miracle Worker. Um, and I'm just going to read um, the first couple of sections from that. When Mrs. Mansour first came to the house, I thought she was alone. Naturally, I could see only her face. The rest of her had been draped in the, in the traditional black. But there was something modern about her right away, even ignoring the fact that she had arrived without a husband. She wore sunglasses. Chanel, I, I saw as she approached, and deep red lipstick. I'm sorry to be reading from my phone, by the way. I promise I'm a supporter of print, print literature and print media. I just do, forgot to pack my book. Do you want your book? Do you want your book? That's OK. okay. <laughs> um, Mrs. Sally Reba, she said, removing the sunglasses. I nodded. Only my birth certificate had ever called me Salvacion. I reached out to shake her henna-tipped hand, but Mrs. Mansour leaned in further to kiss me on both cheeks. She smelled pleasantly of tangerine and something stronger, perhaps a spice. Once the outer gate had shut, she parted her jilbab to reveal a gold-embroidered bodice and a little daughter. Here is Arush, said Mrs. Mansour. The child had been anchored on her hip and concealed by her clothes all along. Mrs. Mansour shifted Arush's face to show me. I was stunned. Back home in the Philippines, I had been trained to work with all manner of special children. But I had never seen any child quite like the five-year-old Arush. Her head swelled out dramatically at the forehead and crown like a light bulb. Faint brown smudges the size of thumbprints dotted her face. Along the left side of her neck grew a pebbly mass of tumors. Arush, this lady is a teacher. Hello, teacher. Mrs. Mansour held Arush's hennaed hand and made it wave. Through the rust-colored designs on her skin, I could see more of the pebbly tumors. I led them from the gate down a tile path to the house itself. A year had passed since my husband Ed and I had moved from the Philippines to Bahrain, and still I thought of these three stories as the house, not our house, certainly not mine. Expatriate families like ours were well provided for, a car, a travel allowance, the promise of schooling if we were ever to have a child. Strangest of these provisions to me was the house, too large for two people. It was outfitted with luxuries I never would have chosen, gold leather upholstery, curtains embroidered with camels and date trees, shelves and tables with brass frames and glass surfaces. Plush red carpeting covered every inch of floor except the bathrooms and the kitchen. We wanted for nothing, and none of it was ours. Having grown up poor and Catholic, with the Beatitudes and tales of the first Filipino workers overseas swirling all around me, I still got nervous at the sight of luxury. I couldn't tell the difference between wealth and obscene, ill-gotten displays of it. In college, before Ed, I had dated a boy who railed against the president for exporting labor to the Middle East. 
to the editor of the Metro Manila Herald, he wrote about the hidden cost of remittances and said, a peasant was a peasant was a peasant, whether on the rice fields or the oil fields, and that at least the Filipino rice farmer could come home every day and see his family. I thought of that old boyfriend sometimes when I looked around my home at the, at the life the oil fields had given us. Certainly, we lived more like foremen than farmers. Mrs. Mansour stopped at a full-length mirror in the foyer. Look here, little woman, she said to Arouche. She lifted the girl's chin and draped the edge of her jilbab around the grotesque little face so that two veiled heads were facing the mirror. Who is that? said Mrs. Mansour. Arouche grunted. I could see this was an established call and response between them, one of the few rituals in which a child like Arouche could be expected to react. In the living room, Mrs. Mansour spoke of the cool weather that day, which to me was not cool, but merely less hot than usual, and of how much she adored people from my country, most of her household help being Filipino as well. Clearly, we would circle for hours around the real purpose of her visit, unless I addressed it myself. Mrs. Mansour, I said, let me begin by telling you that I unfortunately don't speak any Arabic. Of course, said Mrs. Mansour. My friend Minnie had already informed her. But the language barrier, it turned out, did not disqualify me. Mrs. Mansour preferred it this way, for, unbelievably, she wanted Arush to grow up bilingual. Bilang was how she put it. Mrs. Mansour herself had learned French as a schoolgirl in Beirut. She supported Arush's head against her chest as she spoke. With a clutched handkerchief, she caught a dribble of saliva from Arusha's mouth before it could land on their clothing. I asked what else she expected out of Arusha's education. Mrs. Sally, she replied, you know of the deaf-blind Helen Keller and her teacher, Annie Sullivan? Arush grunted. Teacher, you must be Annie Sullivan for my Arush. I had been warned in advance about Mrs. Mansour's illusions. My friend Minnie worked as a maid for the Mansour family. The child can't hold its own head up, Minnie had said, but Madame believes it will grow up to write poetry or cure cancer someday. My friend had sucked her teeth, shook her head. That must be something, no? To be so rich, you think you can buy reality? Mm -hmm. I'll need to know more about your daughter's history, I said. Arouche had been born at full term, the third of the Mansour's children and the only girl. At first, the only trait to mark her as unusual was a largish head. The thumbprints did not appear until she was a year old. The skin broke some months later. The Mansours began keeping Arouche indoors, out of public view. Often, people do not love difference, said Mrs. Mansour. She, on the other hand, surprised herself by how much she cherished Arusha's limitations at first. Arush was the pliant and portable child every young girl imagined when she played at motherhood. You could dress Arush and position Arush and tote Arush around like a doll. She provided no resistance. A welcome quality, said Mrs. Mansour, after years spent raising boys. But by the time she turned two, Arush had yet to grab onto things, roll to her side, sit up, raise her head, make sounds other than grunting or crying, or hit any of the milestones that had come naturally to Mrs. Mansour's sons. Thrusting her tongue by reflex allowed milk and soft foods to fall into her throat and be swallowed, but she had never mastered even an elementary sucking. The Mansours traveled to London, where a battery of tests pointed to a rare, profoundly unlucky combination of cerebral palsy and von Recklinghausen's disease. Her mental age would never advance beyond infancy. Language, of the conventional spoken variety at least, was not in the cards. So they said, Mrs. Mansour shrugged. She took Arusha's hand in hers and gazed fondly at the henna. 
In any other place, with any other parent, this might have been the time to discuss realistic expectations. But I was here in Bahrain with Mrs. Mansour. I thought of Minnie, who cleaned the Mansour's house in Sa'ar six days a week. I thought of my husband working on the pipeline to Saudi Arabia all afternoon in the desert heat. Mrs. Mansour's hopes put me in a position to mend an injury, correct an imbalance. I took a deep breath, then fed her all the bright, teacherly cliches I could muster. I talked of needs and environment and response. Education, I said, comes from the Latin ducere, to lead, and a, out of, to lead out of, I said. With my hands, I made an ushering gesture. Mrs. Mansour nodded, her eyes misting. Her face seemed familiar, yet unreal, as if I had seen her before, but in a dream. As a child in Sunday school, I used to read about certain queens in the Bible, women I pictured with dark eyes and crimson mouths, elegant and proud and doomed. Mrs. Mansour looked like that. Her skin, pale and smooth, was made paler still by the black veil that framed it. This is never so true as with a special child, I continued. We lead her out into the world. She looked down at her ruche and smiled. Teacher, shall we talk about money? We settled on an hourly rate of 50 dinars. Only fair, we agreed, given my level of specialized study and experience. In truth, I had never been paid so well. Certainly, I had never earned money for feeding a fantasy. Mrs. Mansour issued my first check right then to cover any supplies needed in Arusha's first week. Before leaving, she noted the bookshelves in the foyer crammed tight with Ed's engineering manuals and textbooks I had kept since college. A house of readers, said Mrs. Mansour with a nod of approval. So are we. For me, to buy a car is desirable, to buy a book is needful. Until she used those words, it hadn't occurred to me to see these books as trophies, but they were, no less than a car or even a house would be for other people. I could have sold or given them away back home, but used up precious cargo space to bring them here. It wasn't as if Ed or I ever cracked them these days. But our parents had cleaned floors to put us through college. These books stood for how far their sacrifice had sent us. Arush would come at 8 o'clock every morning like a regular child to regular school. I just can't imagine Mrs. Mansour with three children, I told my friend Minnie the next day. She seems too young, or more than young, ageless. Her complexion's like bone china. Absently, I ran my fingertips along a shawl whose peacock feather pattern changed from blue to green and back in the light. We were browsing Abdullah's gift and novelty shop for toys I could use with my new student. It was Minnie's day off. She'd been the Mansour's maid for 16 years, starting before Arusha's elder, eldest brother was born. Oysters, Minnie said. That's her secret. <coughs> now eats one every night to keep herself beautiful. And her skin cream from Paris has caviar in it. Minnie followed me through the store with her hands clasped behind her back. She herself touched nothing, as if to do so would require a special kind of permission not likely to be granted. She picked up a twin bell alarm clock and set it to ring. What is that for? Minnie pointed with her chin. Testing her response to sound, I said. You think there's a problem with her hearing? No, but I'll need to stimulate it if she's ever going to. I cleared my throat. Mm. Acquire language. Arush, acquire language. Are we talking about the same child? I sighed. I'm not sure Mrs. Mansour is. Well, who are you to argue at 50 dinars an hour, right? The first time we met, Minnie and I had also been shopping at the Central Market in Manama. I went there in the middle of the day to avoid crowds. A vendor was weighing my bag of prawns when Minnie approached and told me that I looked familiar. Hadn't she met me before? <coughs> Who was your amo? she asked. Who was my master? she meant. 
my employer, whose maid was I? I explained with a laugh that I was not a maid, but an oil wife, and that the only house I cleaned was my own. We were both embarrassed, many fearing, of course, that she had offended me. But I didn't care about that. What mortified me was the change in Minnie's aspect when she learned I was, as she saw it, a rich woman. She, retreat, she retreated quick, so quickly from small talk to bows and helpless apologies. She was under five feet tall and small-boned like my mother. Servitude had become a habit and posture of her body in a way that felt painfully familiar. familiar. It really could have been my own mother bowing and apologizing to me there at a fish stall in Manama's central market. In Bahrain, I often missed my mother, craved her company and pitied her life more than I ever had back home. And meeting Minnie felt like a reunion in some dream where my own mother thought she recognized me, then didn't. I told Minnie that anyone could have made the same mistake. Recently, I would read in the Manama Times about the wife of a Filipino ambassador who was ordered out of the swimming pool at a Dubai country club. The lifeguard told her only guests, no domestic helpers were allowed there, I said. A diplomat's wife. So at least I'm in good company. I would have gone on and on just to put Minnie at ease. Finally, she did open up, coming back around to the idea of a friendship with me. This was during Ramadan, and Minnie was tired. Their holy month is hell on me, she said. Every year, I wonder if I'll make it to Eid. Fasting makes them cranky in the daytime, and their breath stinks. Then they run you off your feet at sundown and before dawn. And while they slept off their feast, Minnie would dust, mop, scrub, sweep, and wax the house to perfection as on any other morning. You should see it, Minnie said of the Mansour estate. Forget house. Palace is more like it. Months later, Minnie found out that I had a degree in special education. It turned out that the mistress of the house she cleaned was seeking a private teacher for her daughter. What's special about her, I asked. Minnie shuddered at the question. Let's put it this way, she said. Money doesn't buy everything. Then she described Arouche, who had spent most of her five years in her bedroom its windows opening onto a terrace where she was taken for fresh air. Only the family and servants like Minnie, who changed the sheets and dusted there daily and performed a thorough cleaning once a week, were allowed to enter Arusha's bedroom. Likewise, any teacher for Arush would have to be foreign, that is, not an Arab, because the Mansours did not want word of their daughter's condition to spread within their own community. At Abdullah's, I paid for two bags worth of plush toys, rattles, locks, pacifiers, teething rings, and cups with training spouts. I had 40 dinars to spare. Many checked the tag on the blue-green shawl I had admired earlier. 40 exactly, she announced with glee. It's destiny. When I hesitated, she said, oh, Sally, Madame won't ask you for a receipt. I bought the shawl. Outside the store, I draped it around Minnie's shoulders, which were narrow, like my mother's. It's yours, I said. Of course she tried to refuse. Consider it your Ramadan bonus, I insisted, tucking the ends of the shawl into Minnie's collar. From me and Mrs. Mansour.